Mark. We were close. Book of Mark. Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. Let's start in uh, verse 35. We'll go ahead and read this account here. And then uh, start with a word of prayer. Mark chapter 4. The title of this is Peace Be Still. Obviously, you know why that is. Uh, when we read this uh, story here, what Jesus Christ did here on the water. Um, uh, but we'll take it a little further than that, Lord willing, this morning. Mark chapter 4, verse 35. We'll read uh, through the end of the chapter. It says, In the same day when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over into the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship, and there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow, and they awake him, and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said unto one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Dear Lord, I thank you for uh, the opportunity to preach up here. Uh, I don't know how a pastor feels, but sometimes I just 100% don't feel worthy. And... Um, uh, God, I just want to be a vessel uh, that uh, you use, Lord. I don't want them to remember me, but I want them to remember the message, Lord. This word is eternal. Uh, thank God my soul is, but Lord, uh, I just don't want to say something stupid up here, Lord. I pray that you'd guide my speech, guide my mind, guide my heart. And uh, everybody here as well, Lord, I just pray that uh, you would do the work. Your Holy Spirit would speak to us, give us what we need for the day, for the week, for this hour, God. And we're begging you, Lord. We're pleading. Uh, you can answer our prayer. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Peace be still. Uh, this is the only place that it actually shows up in the different accounts, but if you'll go over to Luke chapter 8, we're going to read the other two places it shows up. Luke chapter 8 and Matthew chapter 8. We'll go ahead and get ahead of that. Luke chapter 8 and Matthew chapter 8. You learn a little different things. The neat thing about these passages of Scripture, they complement each other, and they kind of complete the picture. Um, because you have different points of view. You have different people on the ship standing in different places. Uh, we are all here, but we see things a little differently. We have our own perspective, our own point of view, right? They see the right side of me. They see the left side of me. So if I had a big zit over here, they might write, hey, he's got a big zit. They never saw it because they can't see the side of me. You get what I'm saying? It doesn't contradict. It complements. Uh, it tells the whole story. It gives the, 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 the full picture. And I like that. And you'll have Bible correctors come in, and I know Ruckman, man, good night. He's, he's hit on Bible correctors enough, I don't even need to. But they come in, and they'll try and say where they contradict and everything. And they say, well, you know, basically, like, why isn't it all just in one book? Uh, you know, like one gospel. Well, how boring is that? I like having the different accounts. I like having the different points of view. I like seeing the different personalities of each one. Personally, the book of John's my favorite. That's me. I really, man, it's a good one. I think most people probably agree. Man, Matthew writes down some pretty good stuff, too. And then Mark's the only one that says, peace be still. All the other ones says that there is, you know, a calm or whatever. But we'll get to that in a second. Luke chapter 8. I want to get this whole picture, and then we'll kind of just uh, compare and contrast, I guess, a little bit here. Luke 8, verse 22 to 26. Now it came to pass on a certain day that he went into a ship with his disciples, and he said unto them, Let us go over unto the other side of the lake. And they launched forth, but as they sailed, he fell asleep. And there came down a storm of wind on the lake, and they, were filled, uh, and they were filled with water, and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. And he said unto them, Where is your faith? And they, being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, What manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the winds and the water, and they obey him. And they arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. That's the reason I sang that song. I think that's so neat, the way that he penned that thing down, was that this guy was on the seashore. On the seashore. You know, he's over there in the, you know, in, uh, with the Gadarenes, and, and uh, the you know, maniac of Gadara, right? And he's cutting himself and running around, and he sees this storm, and then he sees the, the calming of the storm. And then I imagine after the rains and the wind and the clouds and it brightens up, he sees a man standing on the front of that boat like this, and he's like, whoa. You know, and he gets to meet him, you know, and God cast the devils out of that maniac, and what a sweet picture. I love that song. It's a good song. But uh, let's go to Matthew 8. 
Matthew chapter 8, verse 23 to 27. Getting a little Bible reading today. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, and so much that the ship was covered with the waves. But he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Now, I want to go ahead and point out a couple things here. So you have Mark and Luke both say that the boat was full or was filled with water, right? When I personally think, like just logically thinking, if a boat is full of water, that boat is on the bottom of the ocean <laughs> or the lake or the sea or wherever you're at. If it's literally to the brim, right, it's sunk. You fill a glass full of water and you set it on top of water. No, it's going into the water because the weight of the water is in the boat, right? But then you get over and you kind of see the whole picture when Matthew says it was covered with waves. <laughs> covered with waves. I don't know if you've ever seen these deep sea fishing shows you know, deadliest catch and all these things where they go out and they, these crab fishermen and everything, they're going and catching these crazy, it's like one of the deadliest uh, uh, jobs, I guess, you can do. But there's different types of waves, and I'm not a wave expert, and I didn't look this up, but I've just seen different kinds of waves, and I think you have too. You have like the swells where it's literally just lifting the boat, and you're going with the waves. There's not really water splashing on it, right? You're just kind of like, whoa, getting maybe seasick and throwing up over the edge. I mean, that's rough, right? And then you've got the waves that are kind of a little choppier, and they're crashing into the side. Maybe you're getting some spray, right, on the boat, but it's not really covering. And then you see the ones where it's like, we're about to go underwater, you know? <laughs> you have a wave that's literally covering the ship. Now, if I was writing that down, I might say, the boat was full. <laughs> we were completely covered in a wave. But you know how they design boats with those you know, sides where there's holes on the bottom of the deck, right? And it can kind of leak out. So I imagine that was filling up, and it was just kept emptying out. So you have two of them. It was full. And I'm like, well, you guys drowned. And then you get to Matthew, and he says, it was covered with the waves. I think that compliments. That's pretty neat. Mark says, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And then Luke writes down, Master, Master, we perish. You say, well, they don't say they didn't say the same thing. Did all of the disciples come up and say the exact same thing in unison? Master, Master. And then he didn't pin that down. No, it might have been different people saying the same thing, roughly. You get what I'm saying? I believe it's inspired. You're not going to change my mind on it. I believe it's preserved by the Word of God. I believe that God preserved this. He told him exactly what to write. One says, Master, carest thou not that we perish? In Mark. And then Luke says, Master, Master, we perish. And then Matthew says, Lord, save us, we perish. Lord, save us, we perish. I don't know. Maybe it was Peter, James, and John. I don't know. Because Peter's saying, Master, carest thou not that we perish? You know, Peter had a little bit of an attitude. And then maybe Mark was, you know, Master, Master, we perish. And then uh, 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 or James, I'm sorry, Master, Master, we perish. And then in Matthew, he writes down what maybe the disciple whom the Lord loved, right? Maybe John said, Lord, save us. There's a lot of power in the word of war. I don't know. But I think they all didn't say the exact same thing. You get the message though, right? <laughs> master, carest thou not that we perish? Master, Master, we perish. And Lord, save us, we perish. And then Mark says, uh, that, as far as the words of Christ says, why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? That was Mark. Luke pens down, where is your faith? Well, those are two different things. Maybe he's talking to each one individually. <laughs> why, why does he have to say the same thing to all of them? I mean, imagine this. The boat is literally about to sink, so we think, right? You're watching. It says they were in jeopardy, they were full, it was covered in the waves. Do you think he just like said it one time and they're all like, yeah, we heard you, cool. No, the waves are crashing in, the winds are blowing. I mean, the, the boat is rocking. The funny thing is, is he's taking a nap you know, the whole time. He already had a meeting with the Father on the mountain before, right? He went alone into, uh, into the mountain to pray uh, before he comes down here. But anyways, he, he gets uh, with them here. They're on the boat. One says, uh, uh, he, that he says, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? That's in Mark. And then you get over to Luke and he says, where is your faith? That was probably to Peter. He's like, where's your faith? <laughs> you know, like, well, come, come on, Peter. And then Matthew um, uh, let me see, Luke, yeah, Luke says, where is your faith? And then Matthew says, and mind you, this is before he calms the sea. Ooh, different angle. So did he say something before he calmed it and then after? Because after he calmed it, they were all marveling. Oh, wow, man, he calmed the seas. And then he's going, where is your faith? 
But before he calms the seas, Matthew specifically says, because it's before, he says, Why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? So they wake him up. Oh, Master, we're perishing. We're pastor, carest thou not? Lord, save us. He wakes up and he says, Why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he goes, he calms the sea. Peace be still. And then he looks at one of them and, and, and he says, Where is your faith? <laughs> and then he looks at the other one and he says, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? You all have been with me this whole time. Like, you've seen miracles I've already done. Like, he's already been healing people. There's already been sweet things they've seen. I mean, good night. Uh, Peter, James, and John, I think at this time, had already seen him raise somebody. I could be wrong in getting the things out of order here, but they've seen a lot of miracles, and now they think they're going to die. And, and I, I just really, he's, you know, he's a personal savior. He deals with me individually. Right now, he's not dealing with nations as much as he's dealing with an individual person, Right? So he can say something to you. The Holy Spirit's amazing, and I've said this before. I can preach this message, and you can get something that I never even said. It might not even be a verse I read, and the Holy Spirit's like, hey, did you ever see that before? The Lord pricks your heart, and I'm up here like, I have no idea how you got that. Because God individually speaks to each person. I completely believe that. And I think that it complements each other, though. Not some crazy heresy where a guy gets a hobby horse and goes and splits churches. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about God giving you a special... A hunk of gold right out of the scriptures, and you may never get the opportunity to share with somebody, but it strengthened your faith. It helped you through that trial, that storm you're going through. This is what's cool, though. They all say, we perish. That's three times. They all say, he arose. Three different times. How cool is that? This is not a deep study here, by the way. I, this is just from reading over it. They all say, when they woke him up, that he arose. And then he starts to rebuke the winds and everything. And they all three say, what manner of man is this? <laughs> man, they, they say it a little differently, that the winds and the sea or the winds and the waves obey him or all that, but they all said we perish. They all said he arose, and they all said what manner of man is this. I thought that was cool. Now, I have a, a few points here I want to talk about on this subject, but there are different kinds of storms in life. And I got this from another preacher friend. I took notes when... Um, Dr. Ruckman was pre or Dr. Uh, Peacock, sorry, down in Florida, Jacksonville. He had preached this message this probably three, four years ago. And he talked about the different storms in life. There's different storms in life. Um, and this would be my first point, and I'm just going to, this is kind of his whole message just in a short point. But you have perfecting storms. Perfecting storms. And he used the life of Joseph. Joseph, hey, good kid, right? Wanted to serve the Lord, do right and everything. But look at what happened to him. Look at the fires and the trials he had to go through to perfect him, to get him to the point. Was he ready as a child to lead and be second in command in Egypt? No way, man. He had to get cast down. He had to learn what authority was like in Potiphar's house. And then he had to learn about how to deal with getting lied about. And then he's an authority over the, over the jail, right? So he's continually getting perfected. And God is, you know, scraping dross off. He's teaching him things. I mean, look at Moses. Good night. He was gone for 40 years on the backside of the desert. You know, he's like, was he out of will, with the will of God? I mean, I'd look at him and be like, yeah, man, that brother, he got out. He should have never killed that guy. He should have never got out. Well, look how God used him. I mean, good night. So Joseph, you have perfecting storms. Now apply this to your life. I mean, there's perfecting storms. You don't understand maybe the reasoning for it. I think the majority of them are going to fall in these four categories. And then you have directing storms. You have that uh, storm rise, Eurocladon, Paul's shipwreck. Did Paul plan on meeting those barbarians on that island? That day on Melita? No. <laughs> but guess what? After that viper jumped on him and he shook it off in the fire and it says and they watched him for a while. <laughs> like, okay, the venom didn't get him yet, but wait. And then boom, now they think he's a god. He gets to witness to these people on a random island in the middle of nowhere. They were like, wait, where are we? I think this is Melita. Yeah, there's a directing storm. That storm literally ripped that thing to shreds. That ship, it said they were coming in in pieces. Not a soul perished. Well, they must have been out of the will of God, though. That never would have shipwrecked. Or God wanted them to reach those barbarians. And that was the beginning of a, of a different kind of a journey than what Paul planned on taking there. And he was a prisoner the whole time. How crazy. So you have directing storms. And then you have protecting storms. I think Pastor covered that pretty good a week or two ago when he talked about the half has not been told. Protecting storms. You know, something might happen in your life where you're like, man, I don't understand this trial, this heartache, this whatever. The Lord might be protecting you for something else. You know, I have no idea why in the world, two and a half years ago, he totaled your Jeep, Tyler, with my sister in the car, my two nephews in the back, 
thank God that they're okay. I don't think there's lasting harm or damage. You know, they're not vegetables sipping out of a straw. And if that had happened, I still don't know the answer. But was there something worse down the road waiting for them? I know we always talk about traffic. You know, there's more traffic deaths than there is about anything in this country every year. You know, we're all worried about planes and, and you know, everything else. But, hey, man, you're in the car a lot every day. Um, so you never know what a protecting storm, you know, those times where you have a flat tire, or those times where you're sick and you didn't make it to church that night. And you're like, oh, man, I really wanted to be there. Maybe the Lord didn't want you to be there that night. <gasps> Did I say that? Oh, we should always be at church, right? Even if you're sick, if you're throwing up, sit in the back with a bag, you know, like, <laughs> no, maybe the Lord is protecting you from something. Maybe he's keeping you out. Maybe he's like, you need to stop. You're doing too much. I do that sometimes. I, I get home and guess what? I'm in project mode. I need to spend some time with my family. And sometimes the Lord's like, gets me sick. You wonder why I was sick twice a month, you know, in January? Maybe that was why. <laughs> he's like, hey, sit down. But there's protecting storms. So you have uh, perfecting, where God is, is preparing you for something. You have directing storms, where he's like, whoa, hey, roadblock, I want you to go this way. He's directing you. He's going to do everything he can to shut you down from going this direction. And then you have protecting storms. I think pastor's message covered that more than I ever could today. And then you have correcting storms. Jonah. Jonah 1, verse 11 and 12, they said, uh, then said they unto him, what, what should we do unto thee that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. And he said, uh, said unto them, take me up and cast me forth into the sea, so that shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Correcting storms, you know. Now, as a Christian brother or sister in Christ, we're very good at pointing at everybody else's storms and saying, that's a correcting storm right there. <laughs> I know why that's had. It's because of the sin in his life and his heart. You know, <laughs> so it's so easy to do as a Christian because obviously you're not as bad of a sinner as them, right? Correcting storms. But maybe it's a perfecting. Maybe it's a protecting. Maybe it's a directing. So that's my first point is there's different kinds of storms in life. But guess what? We're all going through them, right? We all get to go through different individual storms. Number two, he controls the storm. We took three, two years, two and a half years. Job, good night. How did it start? God said, go ahead. Go ahead, devil. Go get him. Don't touch his flesh. Go. Go attack his flesh. Don't take his life. God literally controls the storm. And you're praying for a tornado to take your house out so you can get a new build. Amen. He controls the storm. These are some sweet passages. Go over to Psalm 100, uh, 107. Psalms 107. I'm going to read this one verse in Psalm 89. The Bible says in Psalm 89, 9, Thou rulest the raging of the sea, when the waves thereof arise, thou stillest them. So you have to realize, um, uh, God's not only in the whirlwind, He can control that, right? But He also can, can, uh, can calm it if He wants. So you might be at a peaceful time in your life, thank God for the calm and the storm. But you might also be going through the worst part. You know they say, I think it's the, it's the backside of the hurricane's the worst when the winds are coming back, because everything that it pushed one direction, man, it's ripping it out of the ground and just totally, sometimes the wind speed's even bad, worse on that whiplash effect. I mean, wow, that's a bad part of the storm, but to realize that he controls it, your father controls the storm, no matter what happens, you're trusting him. That's kind of hard to do sometimes, but Psalm 107 is a sweet nugget in the rough, I thought, reading here. Psalm 107, verse 21, it says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, and for his wonderful works to the children of men. And let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. They that go down to the sea in ships, that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to heaven, right? You're on the top of the wave. They go down again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man. Right? On a ship, that's exactly what happens. you got guys that will fall overboard off a ship, right? They, st they stagger like a drunken man. I'm seeing the picture. It says, and they are at their wit's end. <laughs> then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they, all, uh, are they glad because they be quiet. So he bringeth them unto their desired haven, the haven of rest, right? Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. And we all looked at that and was like, man, that feels like my life sometimes. <laughs> but you notice uh, he didn't calm the storm first off until they called on him. 
So they mount up to the heaven, they go down again to the depths, their soul is melted because of trouble, they reel to and fro, like stagger like a drunken man, and are at their wit's end. That's usually when somebody calls on the Lord. Not at the beginning, it's at the end of the trial. We literally can't do anything else, we've thrown everything overboard. It's like, well, if you called them before, you might still have those goods, right? He says, then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distress. He's like, I just wanted you to call on me. Literally. That's, at the beginning, you could have seen the storm coming in and been like, Sure, it would be nice, Lord, if that thing could go around us, but if not, we'll hunker down and hold on to you until the storm passes over, right? It says, He maketh the storm a calm so that the waves thereof are still. Then they be glad because they be quiet. So he bringeth them into their desired haven. And I was, I was thinking about that when he calmed the storms. How quiet was it? Man. Then he probably could just get down to a real soft, still, small voice when he talked to him, right? So he controls the storm. One was there's different types of storms, we're all going to go through them. Two, he controls the storm. Three, God gives peace that the world cannot. Over in John 14, we can go over to John 14. John 14. Uh, Because we're going to go through the storms. It rains on the just and the unjust, right? Uh, It's going to be stormy in your life just as much as it's going to be stormy in a lost man's life. Um, I mean, hey, there's a party that wants to thank the Lord if you don't have too rough of a life. Thank God I've been blessed with pretty good physical health. I really have been. You know, uh, for, for the, the things that are, you know, running my family, like my spine's still held together. I'm thankful for that, you know. I mean, I don't want to break my back tomorrow. I'm just thanking the Lord for that. There's some things the Lord may bless me, and then there may be other things where it's like, oh, this is more of a trial. This is more of a struggle. This is more of a hard time, right? So everybody goes through kind of their own unique different things, but you're trusting the Lord through all those things. And what I want to t- say on this point was God gives the peace that the world cannot. You're going to get something from Him that money can't buy. You cannot get in this world. And every drug and substance and sin or whatever you turn to that gives you a salve for a short time, that pleasure for a season, it doesn't last. You, and you don't have the peace. you got to realize you don't have the peace when you do that. Yeah, you might get your mind off of something, you know, when you get that drink or whatever it is. I'm, I'm using something that you put in the body as, as an example. But whatever that thing is, that desire, maybe you're just like, oh, i got to go spend more money just to just you know, distract my flesh from all these trials or whatever. Well, that's why you're in debt, you know, because <laughs> there's no peace in that, though, but the Lord gives a peace. And there's John chapter 14, John chapter 14, verse uh, 26 and 27. He says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. And he's saying that because he knows there's going to be trials, and they're going to need to lean on those words that he said. He, I mean, he knows he's about to go through it. He's about to suffer the judgment for all mankind, right? And hang on that tree. And then he's also weeping inside because he knows what his disciples are about to go through. He's like, you're going to need some comfort. I'm going to send the Holy Ghost. He's going to comfort you. And he's going to bring all things to remembrance. You're going to remember you're still doing the right thing. You're still serving the right God. It's still worth it to go through this trial you're going through. Remember what you've seen in me and just keep on going. And sometimes that's what I need. Sometimes it's an example of another Christian that's gone before me. Sometimes it's reading the scriptures and seeing what the Lord went through. But sometimes there's a trial in my life where it's like, am I really even, like, should this, is this what I should be doing? Is this the direction God wants me heading? I mean, you ever have those doubts? You just kind of wonder, like, man, good night. I'm just humdrum in life. Am I just here to, you know, suck air and consume products, as Preacher Step would always say. Like, you feel like that. Like, when's the last time I had the opportunity to witness to somebody? Not that it's, like, always on my mind, but then sometimes you think of it, you're like, wow, what's that? have I done that? Have I left a gospel tract on a windshield wiper in the last seven months? Like, what, when's the last time I sat down and prayed? When's the last time I talked to the Lord? Like, I, sometimes you just get caught up in that, and the Lord's like, get back to it. You're serving me. Get, just get back on the horse. Keep on riding. <laughs> Safety's of the Lord, right? He says, uh, he'll bring all things to your remembrance. The Holy Spirit is there just to remind you. Hey, you're doing right. And then when you're witnessing somebody, hey, by the way, you did read this first, and this is where it's found. And you're like, I did not know I knew that passage. That's so cool. Whatsoever things I have said unto you. Verse 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. God gives a peace the world cannot. Let's go over to 16, chapter 16. John 16, verse 32 John chapter 16, verse 32, it says, Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone, and yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. And we can all say that. You say, every brother in Christ ever that I've had, he stabbed me in the back. You're not alone. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. And all God's people said, Amen. 
But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Sign sealed, waiting to be delivered, man, to a lake of fire. <laughs> the Lord's overcome that, man. He's already overcome it. But uh, sometimes you feel alone. Guess what? He controls the storm, man. He controls it. He can give a peace the world cannot. Romans chapter 3. Let's go over to Romans 3. I actually have a few verses here I want to read too. I know we're doing a lot of Bible reading. I know there's some preachers they can get up, read one verse of Scripture, and preach a beautiful message that I get a blessing out of. I mean, the whole thing, they've got life experience and stories, and I'm like, wow, that's great, and it speaks to your heart and everything, and hey, he even threw a verse in, and I'm not saying that's a bad way to preach. I, I like to just read a lot of Scripture. <laughs> I was like, if I say something stupid, at least maybe enough Scripture that I read kind of covered it up, you know? Because the Lord gave this to us. Uh, yeah, he gave us preachers, but he gave us a book here too, right? Where's our faith come from? It comes from the book. Uh, Romans 3, verse 10. So I'm not condemning a preacher that does that. Um, maybe eventually I'll become that. I don't know. But I just want to read as much scripture as I can right now. Romans 3, verse 10. It says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. We're talking about the world can't give you the peace. God can. It says, there is none that understandeth, neither is there... Uh, uh, there is none that, I'm sorry, there is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher, uh, with their tongues they have used deceit, the poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, destruction and misery are in their ways. And we all were like, yeah, I think I'm going to turn the news off, That's, this is all true. <laughs> And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That is, wow, pastor, you picked a pretty good book to study through right now. <laughs> so accurate. It says, the way of peace have they not known. How are you going to get peace in the world? I don't even know what you're talking about, man. I don't even know what you're talking about. Peace because of salvation through faith. Romans 5.1, therefore being justified by, pay, by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 10, 15 to 17, And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace, right? And bring glad tidings of good things, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. This is my faith. This is what my whole salvation, this is what my existence is based on. I am literally here to bring him pleasure. What brings him pleasure? The salvation of my soul and uh, the service of my conduct, right? I mean, for me to serve him, that brings him pleasure. So this is my faith. And you know what he gave me out of the deal? He gave me peace. Now, I sing that song about the maniac of Gadara and him talking about the man who calmed the storm that was raging in me. And then I look at those four types of storms. Perfecting, directing, protecting, and correcting. And I thought, you know what? All four were going on before you got saved. All four. He was trying to perfect you. You weren't perfect without Christ. He was trying to direct you to his son. There's peace, right? He says, in the world, you're going to have tribulation. But in me, you're going to have peace. They don't even know what they're talking about. He says, it says, destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. Was that not us? You had the perfecting, directing, and then protecting, he's trying to save your soul from hell, and then correcting. He's like, man, get on the right line. <laughs> so I think all those are, are in play before you get saved. Whether you're a child or what, it's your, still your soul. It's a battle of your soul. And then after that, it's going to be a battle of your spirit, <laughs> a battle of your, your, your body, right? I mean, you're constantly just warring against the spiritual wickedness in, in high places, and it's, guess what it affects? The old pawn, man. I feel like a pawn in the chess game almost sometimes. You know, it's this flesh. He says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. I'm like, but that's what I look at in the mirror every day. But it's the stuff that's behind the scenes. It's affecting this flesh. It's tempting this flesh. Aren't there devils all around us all the time? Aren't there evil spirits? Aren't there fallen angels? Aren't we living in a world of darkness? Isn't the God of this world, little g, isn't he here to blind the minds of them which believe not? Aren't we talking, didn't I just read in Romans 3, all these things, their feet are swift to shed blood? You know what's happening right now? They're swift to shed blood, man. I mean, destruction and misery are in their ways, whose mouth is full of cursings and bitterness. You know what I get to hear every single day? Stuff that I'll never say in this church. <laughs> every day at my job at UPS, not at Carbide, that's a Christian-run company, thank God. But at UPS, man, oh, it's, you get to hear it every day. It's not good. 
God made peace and is the one who can give it. I wrote down Jesus Christ is the peacemaker. You know, you call a gun a peacemaker, the equalizer? That's Jesus Christ. <laughs> I think that's pretty cool. He's the peacemaker. 1 Corinthians 14, 33. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. I love that verse. You get to something, you're like, man, this is confusing. Maybe you shouldn't go that way. Man, they have to bring a, a, a dolly, a two-wheeler, to bring all the Bibles into church that they're reading out of. That's confusing to me. I thought about doing that one day. Bring, bring a dolly in with just with an ESV, an NIV, an RSV, a TNT, a CBS. There's so many of them. Good night, man. You run out. There's so, literally, you can go standard version. You got the New American Standard Version. You got the New Living Translation. You got the New King James Version. You know, the stack of them, and then they call us a cult. That's another, another clip I saw, man, somebody making fun of KJV only. Oh, they're KJV only. You're in a cult. You're like, well, I'm not going to fellowship with you. I'm KJV only. And I was like, well, okay, now you're stereotyping us. You're throwing us all into this thing where you got these crazy people standing outside a, uh, you know, contemporary style church or whatever and calling, man, this is crazy too. I'm, I'm chasing a rabbit. I'm going to shut up. <laughs> Serve the Lord with gladness. Why is a serpent harmless as a dove, Right? I'm not literally going out there trying to chop people up. If the words do, cool. But I'm not going to go into, you know, I'm just going to stop. It's just mm, control my speech. Sound speech. The Bible says in Titus, sound speech. I am so far off track here in my brain. I'm sorry. So God is not the author of confusion. I got on that thing about Bibles because that's just driving me nuts. When somebody makes fun of me because I'm KJV only, I was like, you, I'm not condemning you myself personally. I literally am just saying, I hold this as the standard. If you have a hundred different Bibles, that's confusing to me. Because they not only contradict one another, they contradict the book that literally protects the deity of Christ more than any of the other ones. I mean, bring me one. Let's have a conversation. I'll talk to you about it. But, I mean, I'm not in a cult. There maybe is some people that literally the KJV thing, they're not even going to talk to somebody that uses an NIV. I think that's a terrible attitude to have. I think you should be willing to talk to them. Be willing to sit down and show them. Be willing to, uh, to commune with them. They might be a Christian. They might be a brother in Christ. You know they're saved Catholics? They're just in the wrong church. Hello? So having that grace, you know, truth and grace, and having the balance, because sometimes I am all truth, and then sometimes, you know, the world wants you to just be all grace and just let a bunch of homos walk in your church. We're not going to do that either, right? So um, there's a line you have to draw, but God is not the author of confusion. This is just a little verse. I'm sorry. I chased a rabbit. 1 Corinthians 14, 33. He's not the author of confusion. This book is not confusing. Having a thousand of them up here, that's confusing. But of peace, as in all churches of the saints. He's the author of peace. He made peace. Listen to this. Let's, uh, you can, if you want to go to Ephesians chapter 2, I know I've got you flipping all over the place, but it's really good for you, for you to see these verses. You say, what in the world? He started preaching where he'd peace be still on the, on the seas, and now he's chasing rabbits. Well, they're out. It's springtime. You've got to shoot some of them. You know, they're burrowing under my deck and my shed, and you just, you know, got to chase them down the hole, fill it, and you're done. We're done chasing rabbits, Lord willing. All right. Ephesians 2, verse 14. Ephesians 2, verse 14. He made peace, for he is our peace who hath, bo uh, hath made, I'm sorry, for he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, for to him, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, so making peace. He literally made peace between us and the Father, if we accept him. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them which were nigh. For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. There is literally be peace between you and God. And guess what was before that? Nothing but the wrath of God abided on you. And guess what? Now I'm not even appointed unto wrath, because the peace of God is there. That's because of Jesus Christ. He is our peace in verse 14. And then it says that he made peace later on in the, in the passage. Colossians 1, 19 to 22 says, For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, he made it. 
He made the peace through the blood of his cross. To, uh, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Yet now have, ha hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Peace with the maker of the universe. There's no greater peace. That peace is in my soul. You can't rip it out. You can't cut it out. You can't take it. You, you put me in jail for all time. Even if I renounce the, the name of Christ, that peace is in my soul. You can't take it. You can't have it. You can't have my soul. Take my body. Dismember me. My soul's going to heaven. Thanks for the, the outlet to get out of here, man. Uh, I don't want to be dismembered. Lord, I, please, you know, man. I love the martyr's crown. That's awesome. But whew, give me the grace when that time comes. That's all I'm asking, Lord. He made peace for us. Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The peace of God that passes all understanding. You know what that means? You can't explain it. Because you don't even understand it. You can't even begin you know, to, to describe to someone or explain to somebody when you've seen someone go through a trial that you think no one in this world should ever have to bear, and they come out the other side with a smile, they come out the other side with peace, and then the Lord does that to you. You ever had a trial where you came out the other side and you had peace, or going into it you had peace, and I mean it's something you didn't have control of. That's the best trial or struggle for the Lord to put me through. Something that in the beginning I already know I don't have control of, because now I'm at a crossroads, I have to make a choice. Am I going to be stressed out of my mind about it until it resolves? Or am I going to be like, Lord, <laughs> in your hands, man. Pastor says that all the time. Well, I'm just going to give this to you. It's because of you this is happening. You open the doors, you direct me, whatever. But man, I don't see how this is going to get resolved. I'm, you know, <laughs> I'll sit back and watch, Lord. You talk about the you know, deck being stacked against you. That's the kind of trial that I actually, my flesh hates to say this, that's the kind of trial I like. A kind of trial where I feel like I can fix Man, for some reason, I, I like to try every outlet I can before I seek the Lord. I'm those guys in the storm after everything's already been tried. The thing is just rocking to pieces, and they're like, Lord, save us. <laughs> Last res resort, you know. That's, that's the struggle I have in my flesh. But he says, a peace that passes all understanding. You're never going to be able to explain somebody until they've had that peace in their heart. Until God saved their soul, until God's helped them through a trial, until God's lifted a burden off their life. Or allowed them to bear the burden. Paul asked three times, man. Lord, if you would just, if you'd please. <laughs> and then he asked again, and then he asked a third time. And guess what? He got to live with that infirmity in, the, in his flesh for the, rest of, for the rest of his life. And then Paul is all the passages I just read, talking about peace. How cool is that? He said there's a, passage, a peace that passes all understanding. Now let me say this, we're to live in peace. This is still under the second point of him... Uh, giving you peace, the world can't. We're actually getting through this message pretty good here, but uh, Ephesians 4.3 says, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We're to live in peace. Paul says uh, in 2 Corinthians 13.11, Finally, brethren, farewell, be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. God gives you peace, and now He expects you to keep peace as much as you can. We're supposed to live it says, if it be possible, Romans 12, 18. I quote this in my head all the time. Because there's times where I'm like, buddy, the Lord says, if it be possible. <laughs> I was like, mm, no, Paul said that. He's like, I preserved it. I'm like, mm. if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, what lies in you? What lies in you? The Lord. <laughs> I guess it's possible. You know, I've always thought that was a loophole. I was like, all right, Lord, it's not possible. <laughs> because I thought he meant, like, in me, in my, f no, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. He says, which lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Well, Jesus Christ is the one that made peace. Jesus Christ is the one that brings peace and gives peace. The Bible says the world doesn't even understand the peace. They're living in misery. Good night. They're going for destruction, and they're cutting people down. They don't get the peace. Guess who's got the peace? Guess who should be the peacekeepers? That doesn't mean I'm going to lay down and let somebody shove their sin into my life. That's not what it says. Where did Jesus Christ ever do that? Where did he ever lay down? You know what, scribes, Pharisees? I guess you're right. I shouldn't have healed him on the Sabbath day. 
That's not what he said. No, he's like, man, you guys need to get behind me. Would you not help somebody when their ox goes into the ditch? But boy, their letter of the law, and then the pride's their problem. But peace, keeping the peace. Keeping the peace. And I think there is a fine line between keeping the peace and then holding the line. Because I don't want to drift into the world. But if I can be tender and compassionate towards someone to give them the gospel, to try and introduce a little peace in their life, it's worth it, right? I don't have to go to the gay bar to do that. Nope. There's a guy, he, he used to go uh, to uh, the, the uh, porn conventions in Chicago. And he's like, that's where, that's where I preach them, right where they're at. I was like, they're not looking for God there, man. Don't, I wouldn't even go there. What about your coworkers? Have you witnessed to them lately? What about the dude at the gas station that was standing there leaning against his car while you were leaning against his car? I guess he wasn't in triple X terrible sin, was he? So you couldn't reach him. No, how about you reach him? The dude commuting home from work. I just, is that a peacekeeper? Or is that somebody trying to stir the pot, man? You know, I'm going to go down to the red light district in the middle of busy time and start preaching the gospel. And I'm going to preach out of, what is it, Proverbs 7? Oh, I'm going to preach. <laughs> that is not what Jesus Christ did. I don't see that in Scripture. I really don't. Now, if he got into the synagogues and he read a passage of Scripture and it ruffled their feathers, he's like, all right, you don't want me here. I'm going to go to the next town. <laughs> you know, but he gave the truth, right? We're supposed to live in peace as much as lieth in you. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. I'd like to keep peace with my neighbors. I'd like to keep peace with my coworkers. You know why? I have to see them every day. But they're going to know what I stand for. So you can do that. Um, there will be a, a day with no peace. That's Revelation 6.4. I'll read this briefly. And there went out, one, uh, uh, out another horse. And, there, you know, R Robbie read uh, 4. He read Revelation 4, and then she read Revelation 5. And I'm like, man, if somebody reads, if you read Revelation 6 next week, I'm going to miss it. I have to read it at home. It says, And there went out another horse that was red, with, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth. I won't be here for that. Thank God. To take peace from the earth, that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. Number three, he is in the storm. i got to speed up here. He is in the storm. Um, and uh, I, I have the three different passages here. We'll just read, uh, we'll just read one, uh, one of them. Uh, this is Matthew chapter 14. Let's go to Matthew 14. Matthew chapter 14. You can read these in your own time. I spent my time on the first uh, uh, storm that he calmed there. Uh, but this is, uh, this is Peter when he walks on the water here. Matthew 14. We're trying to draw this up. I'm sorry. I'm long-winded. I'm not. Matthew 14. Um, starting in verse 22. Verse 22. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. Uh, this is right after he feeds the 5,000. Uh, and right before that, you have to remember, John the Baptist was just beheaded. The Lord doesn't have any time to mourn. The Lord doesn't have any time to talk to the Father. Jesus Christ has no time to talk to the Father. His friend, he knows in his heart. He already knows. John's just been beheaded. He feeds the 5,000, and boom, we're right on to this. He's about to go on the water. And straightway, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. Now you find out in the other passages, let me give you these really quick. Matthew 14, verses 22 to 33. John 6, verse 15 to 21. And Mark 6, verse 45 to 52. Read them, compare them. It's neat. You'll get the whole picture. You find out in another one of the passages, they're trying, they're forcing him to be king. It literally says they were going to force him to be king. He's like, I got to get out of here. You guys get on the boat, go to the other side, and he starts sending the multitudes away. So he's alone. He's still there, right? So, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come on the, uh, to, unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go see Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come unto the ship, the wind ceased, then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth thou art the Son of God. And when they were gone over, they came uh, unto the uh, land of Gennesaret. So you have God uh, um, 
He's alone, first off, and he comes into the sea. And the Bible says in another passage, uh, let me see, it's in John. It says they were 20, uh, 5 and 20 or, uh, and 30 furlongs, basically 25 to 30 furlongs out. He said 8 furlongs is a mile. They're about maybe three and a half, three and a half miles out to sea already. And it says, and Jesus sees them on the land. He is on the land, and you have to read these other passages, I don't have the time. He is on the land, and it says they're 25 to 30 furlongs out. They are three and a half, roughly, 3.25 to like four miles out. And it says he saw them. Dude, I wish I had that vision. That's cool. That's not even part of the message. I just think that's cool that he saw them. He's standing on the ground. He's like, yep, they're toiling. Now, it says when they got into the boat, it was, it says, uh, they all say evening was come or the even had come. Starting to get dark, right? So it's at least getting into the first watch of the night from 6 to 9, right? From 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. It's the first watch of the night. And then it says, uh, now it was dark. So now it's getting dark. They've, they've been rowing for a while. They're getting a couple miles out. And then you read in Matthew and Mark, it was the fourth watch of the night. Now we're between 3 a.m. 6 a.m. It's getting closer to dawn. It's the darkest part of the night. The storm's raging at its highest point. They're three and a half miles out, and Jesus sees them from land. And then um, the whole time, uh, that I want to right, tell you this really quick. In Matthew, the whole time Peter comes out when he gets out, on the boat, out of the boat, the whole time he's on the water, the storm's raging. God doesn't calm the storm when he reaches him. And I think the cool thing is, is it says that he gets out of the boat and he's coming to meet Jesus. And then he falls and then it says immediately the Lord reached out. And I'm like, did he just like, whoosh, like shoot across that water? Or was he actually within arm's length? It said he was going to meet. It didn't say he went and met Jesus. He said he was going to meet him. He was on his way. And then he starts looking around at the storm, and he's like, Lord, save me. He starts sinking, and it says immediately the Lord stretched out. So I think maybe he was a little fast there. I think maybe he walked a little fast. Also, they weren't 25 yards off the water. The Lord's been walking on the water for three and a half miles. Hello. <laughs> That's crazy. Fourth watch of the night. They've been rowing for hours and hours and hours, and he's prayed, and then now he's walking on the water. This is so cool. As soon as they board the ship, the wind ceases. John says, in the book of John, you read this account, in John chapter 6, 15 to 21, it says they were immediately at the land. They were immediately on shore. Whew. I'm glad God gave us different accounts, because I'm starting to picture to put the thing together. Well, the wind not only ceases, but they're instantly on land. Jesus is going to step into this storm down here in your life, probably about the fourth watch of the night. And you know what he said to Peter? Come. Oh, there's going to be a time, man. It, the storm's getting more violent, isn't it? And it's getting darker in this world. And I don't know what trial you're going through or what heartache, and this might just be one of the storms of life. And the Lord may say, peace be still. He may calm the waters and the waves. He may rebuke the winds. He may calm it in your life, and you might keep sailing with the Lord. Hey, he's on boat with you, right? But this might be the, one of the last storms. This might be one of the last storms where it is the fourth watch of the night. You have been rowing through the Christian life, and you're like, Lord, we don't even see you. This is, this is rough. And then he's going to look, and he's like, come. And man, as soon as they got back to the boat, peace was on the water. They were on the land. They'd completed their journey. And I'm like, oh, I'm ready to go home. There's some sweet pictures and types you can see in the Scripture. But I guess what I want to get across to you is that uh, he's in the storm. He's in the storm. He controls the storm. He gives you a peace that's outside of this world. And no matter what trial, tribulation, storm you're going through, it could be a correcting storm. Pay attention. Wake up. Scoot a little closer to the Lord if it's a correcting storm. It could be perfecting. You're like, I don't understand why this is going on. I'm doing what the Lord wants me to do. I mean, I'm reading, I'm praying, I'm witnessing, whatever it is. Maybe there's a ministry you have. Maybe it's just daily devotions. Maybe it's just a conversation with the Lord every day, and you've got peace in your heart about that. Do what God has you to do. But when the storm comes, man, Draw an eye to God. He'll draw an eye to you. He'll give you that peace. I think that's a really cool picture, a type that he gave us there with Peter, though. He says, come. And you know what? The storm didn't cease right away. They had to get back on the boat. So the whole rest of the way, Peter didn't sink because he was looking at Jesus. <laughs> it doesn't say that he was wrapped up on or anything, but man, he couldn't take his eyes off of him. Storms in life, but Jesus Christ can, can, can bring a peace. So, let's all stand and have a word of prayer. Don't you love a long-winded uh, preacher? <laughs> Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you so much. What a, what a 
just blessing it is to preach to this church, Lord. Uh, I love these folks, and I pray that this uh, was a help, a blessing, a refresher. Um,